Right to Reason podcast. I'm your host, Robert Stanley. Today, I'll be talking philosophy with Christian apologist Eric Hernandez. I am so fucking ready for this. Maybe you noticed, but this episode is PG friendly. He intends to use this for a Christian broadcast, so it had to be edited for our slightly more sanctimonious compatriots. This episode is going to fuck epistemology right in the fucking shit Emmanuel Kant fucking pancake shit Bill Cosby style. Let's get started. It's the Right to Reason Podcast. This episode of the Right to Reason Podcast is brought to you by our patrons and contributors like me. We have all recognized the value of the unrestrained marketplace of ideas and have decided to make a difference. You can make a difference too. Contribute at patreon.com forward slash right and learn more about your right to reason at the right to reason.com. Your activism is appreciated. Okay, people, I'm going to introduce to you a man that I have been looking forward to talking to for months now. Is it months? Is it maybe over a year, Eric? How long have we been planning this thing? We've been... Yeah, uh, I think you first reached out to me sometime in the summer. Yeah. And that was right around the time I was moving, so yeah. Okay, so months, yeah. All right, uh, I am reading from Eric Hernandez Ministries. That's erichernandezministries.com. All one word, no space right there. I would read it for you, but it's a lot of letters. I'll include it in the show notes if you guys want to check that out. But here is his bio. Eric Hernandez is a dynamic, young, evangelistic, and apologetically inclined pastor and teacher who has a passion for proclaiming the gospel and defending his faith on theological and philosophical grounds. He is a licensed minister, certified formation therapist, and a new apologetics lead for Texas Baptists. We're both Texans, Eric. We're already going to have a lot in common. Eric is well-respected and sought after for his evangelistic messages, expository ability, and insight into apologetics. He has spoken and debated on a public level. I can actually reference that just as a side note. I heard you with Matt Dillahunty. I've heard you with David Smalley. By the way, what Matt Dillahunty was talking to Matt slick and you had a question for him you even made like a little youtube video about that that people can find on that website uh once mm-hmm. again it's eric dot that i want to play if that's okay with you uh yeah go for it i'm not violating any licenses agreements or okay, yeah i'm just gonna play it so um <laughs> <laughs> uh let's see where do i leave off here he has spoken and debated on a public level at universities and college campuses where he adamantly and adequately defends the christian faith against atheist agnostic deistic professors of different worldviews. He holds an associate degree of social science. I can relate to that. I'm a poli-sci nerd, a bachelor degree in theology. I, I went to BJU, so we got we got a lot in common. I went there for a, a Bible. So cool. Oh, right on. Yeah, I, I dropped out. I didn't make it. That place was too strict. But anyway, and is currently enrolled as a PhD student and also a master's degree. You're doing both at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah, working on both. From Trinity Seminary, he is the founder of Eric Hernandez Ministries, which encompasses speaking engagements, apologetic seminars, weekend training courses, and debates. He's married to Kendall Hernandez, and the two are proud parents of Addison Grace and Hudson Ryan. I got two kids myself. Man, we got a lot more in common than we probably have different. Uh, So I'm thinking this conversation is going to be awesome, even though we disagree about, like, fundamentals of (laughs) <laughs> of basic reality and and maybe even a little science and and philosophy. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Do do we disagree on like science stuff, evolution? Where do you stand on like evolution or stem cell research or global warming? You know, like those kind of things. I don't I don't need like the long diatribe thing. I just you know just basically like are you are you like one of those modern Christians that's cool with that stuff? Or are you like you know you keep it you keep it basic? Uh, it would be case by case, I guess. Uh, okay. Regarding evolution in general, um, I reject uh, the. Uh, what I understand to be the Darwinian, na- or at least a naturalistic evolutionary account where you have godless evolution. Um, as far as the change in certain um, species, uh, from what I understand to be macroevolution, I have issues with that from a metaphysical oh, perspective wow. and even a scientific perspective. But I'm I'm open to it. It's okay. not something I necessarily take a stance on. Like I said, unless it's the naturalistic evolution, of course, I would deny that. If I said evolution proves that Genesis 1 and 2 – whether they you would agree they contradict or not, but it proves that either one is false. The world wasn't created in six days. Would you push back on that? I it depends on what we're talking about, but usually whenever I, especially if I'm speaking with someone who's a non believer, my primary issue is I always like to think of it if I'm in like a taxi cab or an elevator ride and I only have a certain amount of time, what would be my focus? Well my focus would be does God exist and is Christianity true? So whether or not 
the Bible is reliable, although I deem it important. The more fundamental part is, does God exist and is Christianity true? Right. So right. if okay. we're depending on how long we had, I would say, okay, well, let's let's set that aside. Yeah. Does God exist? You know, I didn't want to get an evolution. I was just trying to like uh, just at random. I was thinking like, I wonder how much we actually agree because yeah. it seems like we have a lot in common. You're a fitness dude, dude. I love I love working out. I love fitness. I I, I encourage that a lot uh, with anybody that I talk to, family and friends. Uh, not just for the physical benefits. I like living. <laughs> I I don't want to yeah. die screaming. Although most of us <laughs> do, but um. Yeah, you you are cut up like a coupon, brother. What's up with that, man? <laughs> like like this is coming from somebody that is not cut up like that. Like like I you know I, I like going to the gym. Uh, I do like my fifteen minutes on the uh, elliptical. I do five minutes spread on the treadmill. Then I do back, shoulders, arms, squats, all that kind of thing. Like I got a little routine. I got a little punchy thing I do uh, uh-huh. where it's like a machine where like you can kind of pull the rope and put how much weight you want on that tension, you know. Mm-hmm. And I just get in position, dude, like as if you're about to get in a fight, and do like mm-hmm. you know leg from the floor up to the waist yeah. twist, stretch that chest out like a rubber band, and then come in, pow. Pow, and I just keep doing those over and over, and oh my god, it has it has really helped me out. Like it thins you up, it cuts up all that stuff in that core area, but it also builds up that shoulder muscle. Anyway, it, I, I respect that, man. You are a, a fitness freak. Would that be a, a good way to <laughs> well, say it? Nobody knows uh, it. Nobody, because all your debates, you're always wearing a suit. Nobody knows what's yeah. underneath. <laughs> <laughs> what you got funny. under there, man? Uh, yeah, well, maybe you might have been looking at some older pictures, but <laughs> oh, uh, did you get no, fat? Did you get fat after marriage? I got uh, fat after I, marriage, I, dude. I gained some weight after I marriage. Totally I, I got up. I got fatter than I was when I got married. When I got married, of course, you know, I was I was working towards that that date, and you oh, know, things okay. were were going great. Uh, since then, I haven't focused too much on cutting, but I have been hitting the weights again. Okay. okay. And not not that I like you know just lost everything, of course, but yeah, you're you know, still when you look at healthy. old pictures, you're like, gosh, you know, that that gotta <laughs> get back there. You but, missed the uh, glory days. <laughs> uh, but I'm getting back into it. And there's a lot of, and when I was cutting, there's a lot of things I did. One thing, obviously, counting calories, and then intermittent fasting. That's that's a really fun way to help. Yeah. Well, I don't say fun, but that's a really good Enough way to kind of keep track of what you're eating and set a window for when you can eat. And yeah, it's really helpful. How many hours do you recommend for intermittent fasting? And in, in case anybody doesn't know what he's talking about, this isn't fasting like you know the Christian Jewish <laughs> fasting oh, or something. Not- More like a. Uh, uh, you know, you go to bed at, let's say you go to bed at 12, you get up at eight, that's eight hours that you haven't eaten and then add another eight to that. And then you got, is that, is that what you recommend about 16 hours of not eating something like that? Yeah, it's usually what's recommended. Um, you, you're not eating for 16 hours and there's an eight hour window during the day that you will eat and whatever calories you're going to eat, you eat within that window. Uh, it helps with the metabolism, helps burn fat. Um, and then I would usually work out fasted. So on an empty stomach. Sometimes not having eaten for quite a long time, wake up in the morning, working out, then doing some cardio really helps burn the fat. And this isn't just like your body isn't eating food, so it's not burning the food. This is actually a a biological fact that once you aren't putting glucose and sugar in your body, that your body starts working on the fat and and, and it starts actually burning all of these calories in a healthy way. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, the way I think about it is let's say you eat. Isn't that called ketosis? I'm not sure what it's called. <laughs> okay, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically, like, if I already eat and then I work out a few hours later, then I'm going to be using the energy from the food that I just ate. That's going to be my source of energy. If I work out on an empty stomach, then I have no food in my stomach, so my body's going to reach for that stored fat that I have. And it's going to use that for energy to burn. Okay, so you exercise on an empty stomach. You coffee up? You at least get some get some caffeine in you before that? Uh, no, every now and then maybe a pre-workout, but um, no, nope, just, just wake up. And, and I, I used to wake up sometimes, especially – at the job I used to work at, I'd have to, I'd have to be in there um, quite early. So I'd wake up sometimes like at four, you know, throw on some clothes and go to the gym. Yeah, that's a good strategy. Do you do a, do you do a little pot first? A lot of people like to smoke a little weed before they work out. I, I, I tried it <laughs> and I just, I am not like a weed guy. Like I'm not anti-weed. Like I, I really, I like to keep the cannabinoid receptors activated, you know what I mean? And smoke occasionally, but I'm just, I don't want it to be part of my daily life. It doesn't, it doesn't just, it just doesn't flow with my personality, I guess. I don't like to stare into the abyss, as, as Nietzsche would say, <laughs> because that motherfucker stares back at me. Oh, sorry for swearing. Is, do, do you have a problem with swearing? I don't want to offend you. <laughs> no, that's okay, your show. I can swear. All right. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, but, but do you recommend that in part of an exercise or would you say you want to, as a Christian, want to abstain from that sort of thing or? Well, I, well, I'd say Christian or not, I wouldn't recommend it uh, unless you have some kind of like a medical need for it. I, I personally don't see a problem with that. But again, I, I, I'm not an expert in the area. 
God, I tried weed once when I was like once? 15. You tried it once? <laughs> Yeah, and I did not like it. Yeah, so a little bit of background prior to, you know, me and Jesus were like on good terms. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, I tried it just and it was never uh, like a peer pressure kind of thing. I was really just curious. I've always been a curious person. I've always liked to ask questions. I always like to see things for myself. If someone said, oh, stay away from this, I'm like, why? You know, right. especially in church. That's why I'd get in trouble in church for my youth pastor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, one time my friends were talking about getting high. I'm like, hey, when are you going to do that? And they're like, oh, we're going to do it, you know, on Monday. I'm like, hey, great. I want to try it, but I don't want to pay for it. Can I go? Can I join? <laughs> you know, so it was never like people trying to pressure me. And I hated it because also at the time I used to love to fight. So you didn't fight a lot. I had an anger problem. And after we had smoked weed, they were talking about going to fight, you know, something, something. And everybody knew if there was a fight going on and they needed help, they would. You know, I'd be the one to call and we'd go do something. But being high, I just didn't feel like I was in my body the way I usually feel. I'm like, I can't fight like this. I don't like this is horrible. This is stupid. Why would I do this? Why would you smoke before you're going to go fight? And yeah, I just and there are some other bad experiences associated with that, that it just really turned me off to it. And now that I'm older, of course, seeing just the effects of just smoking in general, especially prior to working out. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend it. Definitely. Okay. Fair enough. You were probably that kid in Sunday school with his hand up that the teacher's like, uh, all the time. Yeah. So yeah. here's, here's a, here's a time I want to play this clip. You had your hand up at the Matt Slick and, uh, Matt Dillahunty, two Matt's going head to head. Yes. Okay. Hey Matt. Good to see you. Hey, how you doing? All right. All right here's Eric walking up to the mic. What you're supposed to do in these things. Um, on, on Matt's worldview, Matt Slick, uh, his brain was designed to obtain truth. But on your worldview, there was no design. So it sounds like you're essentially saying that I can trust my brain because my brain tells me that I can trust it. So my question is this. How do you escape this viciously circular, self-defeating, begging the question worldview without appealing to your brain? Because even if you say that you can demonstrate it or test it with any brain. All right, I'm going to pause, I'm gonna pause it real quick. I can't do it. I can't. I, I just can't sit back and listen. I'm not good at this. I'm like you in the Sunday school thing. I got to I got to ask questions. Are you like a what's that called? A presuppositionist? <laughs> no, no. In fact, you no. knew where I was going with it. You started laughing already. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I did a debate with, um, uh, well, conversation slash, you know, debate because we disagreed yeah, yeah. with a gentleman known as Seiton Bergenkate on <laughs> apologetic <laughs> methodology. So he's what you would consider a, a presuppositional apologist. So you debated um, Sai. That's yeah. so cool. I didn't know that. Oh, I got to find yeah. that one. Where can people find that? Is that probably on YouTube or something? Yeah, you can on my YouTube channel. Okay. I'm yeah, going to be looking there. for it. The listeners will be looking for it. But okay, please continue. Yeah, So, but people uh, sometimes will accuse me of that. And uh, I mean, that, that's a whole other long story. And, you know, we explain a little bit more in, in our conversation that I have with Sai. But um, usually the confusion relies around presupps uh, really like to focus on God being the necessary preconditions for intelligibility, which I agree with. In, in fact, I would say God is the necessary condition for anything at all to exist. And um, rationality, intelligibility is just one area you can focus on. Um, but the argument that I'm referring to would be known of something like Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism, or it's often called the argument from reason. So it's not like I'm saying um, something like Sai would say, uh, from what I understand, is something like, well, you need God for logic and reason. Okay, Mr. Atheist, you're using logic and reason. And if you're using logic and reason, then you know God exists too because you cannot use that if God doesn't exist. That's where I accuse him of saying, well, no, that's an invalid jump there because you're talking about two different things. You're talking about epistemology and an ontology. Epistemology is a study of knowledge, you know, beliefs, whereas ontology is the things that exist or ground the existence of something else. So I say you're I, – I, accused him and said you were you're, you're doing like almost like a bait and switch you're you're yeah. asking about their belief in god but then saying that given that logic and rationality can only exist if god exists which is an ontological question you're accusing them that because they have the epistemology they therefore also believe which is also epistemology the ontology but here's why here's here's what i said in, in our discussion if you ask me does the number two exist i would say or no excuse me if you ask me is the number two even I say yes, even that's 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 my belief about the number two. A but then if you ask me, yeah, yeah, and then if you ask me, okay, does number two exist? I would say, well, I don't, I don't know. I haven't studied all the literature on it. You know, I haven't perhaps taken a position. That's an ontological question, which shows I can make an epistemic, I can take an epistemic position without committing myself to an ontological position. And that's where I would say, so the atheist can use logic and rationality because they're doing epistemology, but that does not necessarily show that they're taking an ontological position of where it comes from. They may even say, well, I don't know where it comes from, but I know that I can use it. And I say that's fair, but that doesn't mean that therefore they know God exists because now you're 
switching from epistemology to ontology. You argue you can have one without having to accept the other because you can entertain two thoughts at the same time. Would you agree that the atheist can do that as well? He doesn't necessarily have to say where reason, uh, you know, the laws of logic come from, but he can utilize them to make his rational decisions. Yeah, and that, that's what I was okay. arguing for in yeah. my discussion with Cy. Right. So now, now where where I would push is kind of what you're hearing in the question here is okay. I understand you can take that position as, as far as that's your belief, but now let's focus on the ontological question of why or where does it come from? How how is it possible in the first place that we can trust something like our brain, our cognitive faculties? What reasons do we have to trust them? And I say, okay, well, let's look. The implications of, I would argue, the atheistic worldview is you can't. And, you know, we can talk about that later if you'd like. And if you can on the atheistic worldview, then you cannot rationally affirm anything. You cannot trust anything, any beliefs that your brain produces. And you're kind of left in this state of uh, like a, a loophole or a vicious cycle of not being able to affirm anything not be able to know whether or not your beliefs are true. It's terrifying. And, <laughs> I can tell yeah. you from the point of view of an atheist, I guess I can relate to that a little bit. Let me finish your question. And then you thought Matt, Matt's answer sucked, I think. But I thought, <laughs> I thought at least he answered honestly. But that, yeah. that is a problem. I would, I would Every... sucked, yeah, I would, I would just the, the fact that he answered honestly, I appreciated. Yeah. And, and that's just the point. I mean, that, I mean, there really is no necessarily further point than that. But hey, he's being honest. And, and this is what you got on atheism. And I just leave it at that. You know, well, I mean, you, we all you take it where problems. you want from there. Yeah. I mean, Christ, I, I feel like theism itself has some problems. So Christianity has some problems. Uh, philosophy's talked about this for ages, you know. And one thing that – you know what really pissed me off, man, is whenever apologists don't reference the classics. And I, I heard you on Dogma Debate, and you did that Theseus ship thing, and I thought uh – -huh. Dude, I thought that was on our side. What are you using it for? And but but I, I respected that you're referencing the classics. I, I've always heard it used in terms of identity, but you used it as kind of a pushback, a, a, a sense of hey, let me defend my beliefs, let me critique yours or attack yours in a way to make you start rethinking things. Still, I, I was speaking to a Christian apologist. It, I don't get offended by somebody evangelizing. I come from that background, and that's exactly mm -hmm. what I'm doing as an atheist. We're both evangelists in a way. Yeah, you know? I'm glad you said that because that's yeah. how I characterize we, a lot of atheists. Exactly. And, we have yeah, a lot yeah. in common as long as we're not acting like dicks to each other. I think we can we can work some stuff out, maybe ask these questions, maybe get answers, maybe not, but at least we can try. But this guy, he says, uh, I'm, I'm going to start an apologetics class and one of the parts of the course is going to be ethics. And I'm like, oh, cool. Who are you referencing? You're going to get into a little deontology. You know, you're going to do some virtue ethics. You're going to talk about mm. utilitarianism. What's up, man? That sounds cool. And he goes, yeah. oh, no, I'm going to reference. And, and then he named like people that are still alive. I don't think, <laughs> you know, like William Lane Craig or actually that's not one of them. He's, he's going to listen to this and he's going to be pissed at me. I'm not talking about him i love the guy he's a cool guy he's a friend it's, it's just the idea like not referencing classic philosophical contributions to what got us to where we are is insane yeah. if we're going to talk philosophy but i've noticed and a lot of times that you talk you do that and i appreciate that okay i'm i'm well, rambling i want to play this thing but on your worldview there was no design so it sounds like you're essentially saying that i can trust my brain because my brain tells me that i can trust it so my question is this how do you escape this viciously circular, self-defeating, begging the question worldview without appealing to your brain? Because even if you say that you can demonstrate it or test it with any brain, then you are still using your brain and we're back to the same problem. Sure, under what you said you can. <laughs> Matt Slick's face in the moment is <laughs> uh, precious, man. He's yeah. like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Under what, under, under how, the way you just described it, there is no resolution to that. And my position is that there's no resolution to it under his claim that he can resolve it either. But that wasn't my question. You, you messed me up. I was going to sit down. Uh, no, but my question is, on your own worldview, it's not on designed my world to view, obtain truth. So how do you escape the circle? Without using your brain, what, can you, what else can you use? Is my only question. I, 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 nothing. That's pretty no, much it right there. Yeah. We've already touched on a lot of stuff, right? We've already kind of gotten into like ontology, uh, uh, evolution. I wanted to ask you a classic you like the classics, I want to push a classic on you. The Euthyphro Dilemma, Plato, the story of Socrates talking to Euthyphro. A lot of people think Euthyphro brought it up. Socrates is arguing this point to Euthyphro, and he asks, basically, are the gods being pious to be pious, or are they pious because the gods are doing it? Does, does the act itself make it pious? Which, um, a modern way of 
characterizing it in a monotheistic way of talking about stuff. And we don't really say the word pious anymore because it's kind of d- But, you know, we'll say, like, if God does something, is he doing it because he is doing good, therefore kind of like reaching some kind of good that exists beyond him? Or is it good because God does it? Kind of like dipping into that, what I would think is kind of a a problem with divine command theory, uh, the way that I was at least raised in in my church upbringing. But I want to throw that at you. Like, whenever God does something, is it good because God is following the path of good? Or is... It's good because whatever God does is good. God can punch an old lady. That makes punching old ladies good, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, the first thing I guess we'd have to resolve is whether or not morality exists, objective morality. And I'm sure you're familiar with the argument, but um, coming from the argument first is, does objective morality exist? Well, if it does, it will need to be grounded in something. And that's where God would come into play. Because uh, take, for example, the notion that the number two is even. That's an objectively true statement. And it's not dependent on whether or not you or I exist. So even if you, if everybody in the world died today, the number two would still be even, which would show it's, it's something that transcends the human mind. It's not grounded in anybody's preference or opinion. And hence, it's been said, truth is discovered. It's not invented. Now, if the number two being even is something that is necessarily true, then it has to be true from eternity past, if you will. There was never a point in time where it began to be true. So the what, grounding what, what, of it's, hold on, uh, the hold on. Re- I, I hate to be uh-huh. that that jerk that interrupts people. I'm not trying to interrupt. No, I'm actually, no, for, cl- for sake of clarification, not for like, I have an opinion. <laughs> it's not like that. When you say it had to exist eternally, have been now true. I'm like, whoa, I, I don't know. I mean, true. like space time. Like there was not a point in time where it began to be true. There's a certain point in time that n- the number two is even that had to exist forever. Am I understanding you correct? Be true. It had to have been true. It had to be true. Like, in other words, yes, yeah, that, there was never that a truth, time that epistemological fact had to be eternal? In the sense that, right, in the sense that there was not, it's not as if we say in 1950, the number two began to be even. And from right. that point on, it was true that the number two like, was even. Like, the, the concept of eternality is a little bit beyond us. That I mean, that huh. that dips into, like, we can prove that infinity exists. We can we can take a diameter, right, How's that? and multiply it times 3.14 and figure out a circumference, but we know that that number, 3.14, doesn't end. There is an ability of infinity within mathematics, and if it's in mathematics, then it's probably within the universe, because the universe can be understood via mathematically. That's how we got quantum physics, right? But it's... Well, I, I would I would disagree there, if I if I could. Uh, also, not, not interruption, just for clarification. No, so no, I wouldn't, please, please. I don't, think an, I don't think an actual infinity exists. I think a potential infinity exists, but I don't believe that an actual infinity exists. Whoa, I'm getting I'm getting weirded out. You're a Christian. You believe in the word of God. You believe in the Bible. The Bible says God is eternal. And and if I die, don't I burn for eternity as an atheist? Don't you go to heaven and, and dance around on clouds? I'm I'm being no, that's not fair. That's not fair. I don't mean that. No, I'm, I'm goofing off. But no, I mean don't you go to a paradise eternally? I mean I thought you would think that eternality is a physical reality. Yes. It, it, you are, it so not trying to get into the intermediate state of death and resurrection and the resurrection, what heaven and hell is, setting that aside. Yeah, so that would be a potential infinity, meaning it, it we, we're reach, we're going towards that, but we'll never reach it. So in other words, if I asked you. Oh, like an asymptote many, on, on like a X, Y axis. It never really hits the Y, right? <laughs> uh, right. So <laughs> you say, what'd you call me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not yeah, so if I asked asymptote. you how many numbers does it take to count to infinity, what would you say? I don't, I don't even know how to answer that. Right, right, because you can't reach it. It's not a reachable thing. You can potentially head in that direction, but you'll never reach it. Okay, so you, fair enough. So there can be a potential infinity, but it's not as oh, if there is an actual infinity. I see what you're infinity. saying. I see. You're, you're being very careful. Whenever When I brought up infinity, you went, whoa, hold on. That's a Pandora's box, brother. Let me be very careful with my wording. That's what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, fair to. enough. Oh, I respect that. I respect that. I kind of I push back a little bit, and you're pushing back a little bit, and that's fine. Okay, so does God do good because he is attaining good, or is that which God does good? A priori, yeah, so, because he oh, does sorry. it, that makes it good. Yeah, and again, so this would go back to, first, if morality exists, and God is the standard of it. Uh, if you will, he is a ruler by which we measure it. Now, as it's often been said, especially by someone like Willem and Craig's, he would argue that it's a false dichotomy. It's not either uh, one or the other. There's a third option, and that would be that God is the standard of good. Here's the best way I've heard it explained, and I think it was C.S. Lewis who put it this way. Suppose I took you and, let's say, three other people, and we go to New York, and we get on a high, uh, tallest building there is, 
uh, there, and we look at the skyline, and I say, okay, guys, everybody draw me your best picture of New York. And everybody draws a picture, and I say, I'm, I'm going to be the judge, and whoever gets closest to the picture will get a prize, you know, million dollars, whatever. What standard would I use to judge the pictures? Well, I would use the New York skyline, okay, because that's, that's the standard that we're using to judge who's going to win this contest. But how about this question? What standard do we use to judge the New York skyline as to whether the New York skyline looks like the New York skyline? Mm, well, I guess just right off the bat, I guess pictures that were taken before yours, but that doesn't really help either, does it? You could compare mm -mm. it to all yeah. the pictures and try to find some kind of uh, theoretical concept, you know, something something beyond <laughs> the picture that represents all the pictures since you're melding them together. What what do you think of in your own head? A concept of the New York skyline, but then that that's subjective and bias. You, you could just look yourself and see if the picture that was taken, like if somebody's taking a picture with a black and white camera, right? And then you look at it and you go, oh, well, this one's got color. This one doesn't. But either way, everything's kind of subjective. It's like a, it's like a labyrinth. It's like a, a spider web of different perspectives. So, yeah, I'm with you. I'm following you. Well, well, I would say well, I, I would say the simple answer is, well, there is no standard to judge a New York skyline for whether or not the New York skyline looks like the New York skyline because that is the standard that we're using to judge everything else. So there are some notions that we would call basic notions, sometimes even called primitive notions, where you can't really go – further than that that's that's the bedrock that you hit like a basic and, belief kind of thing um sure in in that in that ballpark okay where it's that there's nothing further that you can go from there so you no longer ask necessarily why questions but what questions you know if we, going back to the number two we say the number two is even okay what does it mean to be even the number six is even well what does it mean to be or why is it even and then well you would have to kind of redefine what evenness is and you can say well evenness is something a number that is divisible by two Okay, well, what, well, why is it divisible by two? But at that point, you're going to have to go back and kind of say, well, because it's even, because you hit a point to where there's no longer questions of necessarily why is this this or that, but necessarily, okay, well, what does it mean to be even? And once you define that, there's really no more basic that you can go than that. So you've hit a bedrock, and of course, the argument is a focus on why do these things exist in the first place? And I would say that God is the best explanation for objective morality. Would it be fair to say that whenever we're trying to understand numbers, that these are symbols and concepts that we as rational, independent agents use to interpret reality, that they're not necessarily the same as reality. These are things that we are using to stand in place of reality. And that kind of like Foucault postmodernist kind of BS stuff, but you know, there, there's some value to it if, if you start to like back away from the structuralism of it, right? And you start looking at things like, okay, the color red or the word red, R E D, that, that's a better way. Language is very helpful here. Okay. The word red is just a way that we try to interpret the fact that whenever we see sunlight reflecting off that red delicious apple, that it's absorbing all the different colors except this one, and that's what it's reflecting. But that's not really reality. The apple's not red. The apple is what it is. We just interpret that as red, and we all agree to a common framework. And I kind of wonder if whenever you talk about morals or the good or the nature of God, that maybe you're recognizing objective morality, but whenever you say God, it's kind of like you're saying red, or you're saying the number two, or you're saying uh -huh. even. These are tools for us. Mathematics is a tool that we use to understand reality. Well, let me, let me like, jump in like, real quick. Um, maybe God's just a number. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, like, yeah, I, I get where you're coming from, but yeah, so a few things you brought up that we'll, we'll have to address. That was a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just think you're, you're, you're making a few, and I mean this respectfully, uh, a of few course. mistakes in, in your train of thought there. You, you asked if numbers were just notions and not uh, reflections of reality, I think. No, um, I'm not saying they're not reflections of reality. I'm saying that they, they are ways that we interpret reality, but... The cosmos doesn't okay. really care how you shape the number three, whether it's a Roman numeral or an Arabic right. or whatever, <clears throat> or that you call it three. You might call sure. it thrice. I mean, it doesn't matter. These are just uh -huh. concepts that we use to understand well, reality. Well, let, let's look at this, though. So, so, you did, so then, for clarification, you would agree that numbers are a reflection of reality. It's just the words that we use to define the reality of experience. I don't even like reflection. I don't even like... I, not to not to once again be and interrupt you, but I don't even like reflection because a reflection is a physical, real thing that happens. Um, well, why, why would I want to I want to phrase it in more terms of uh, sociologically. They are tools that we use sociologically and conceptually to understand reality. But why, why did you uh, why did you say that 
reflection reality as something physical. Are you, are you assuming that all reality must be physical? No, I'm saying a reflection is something that is a response of light. There, no, okay, so a, a reflection, reflection is, is in... something we can prove by photons. <laughs> Uh, in, in other words, if I say this reflects my personality, obviously I'm not talking about something physical okay, okay. or so physical reflection. You're, yeah, but you're you're using that word and so, okay, you pushed back earlier with with a little bit of semantics about uh, eternality, and I totally dug it because I'm like, no, fair enough, we got to be careful. I'm pushing back. You pushed back about something uh, like a biblical concept. I'm pushing back about a scientific concept. All right, we got we got the Christian saying, hey, be careful. And now we got the atheist going, hey, be careful whenever you're talking about this physics stuff. We're, we're on the same page, okay? We're both being very careful about semantics. And whenever uh -huh. you start talking about a reflection of something, you might be saying it poetically, but I'm saying like, eh, dude, when I look in a mirror and I see myself, like the reverse image of myself, that's science. So whenever whenever you say it's a ref numbers are a reflection of reality, I'm like, Okay, like, I get where you're going. Like, if you want to have, like, a poetic, metaphysical, uh, metaphorical discussion, I'm totally down. But if we're going to get real literal, we got to be careful. You know what I mean? The okay, same so, way you were careful yeah. about infinity. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. So, so what if I use the word correspond? It's a correspondence of reality. I don't, I don't know. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, Eric? <laughs> correspondence <laughs> of reality. I don't know. Yeah. It's, 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 so how would you... That's how it defines truth. Hold on. Truth I'm, that, I'm, getting, I'm getting a weird vibe. I'm getting like you have an agenda. <laughs> how about this? How about this? What if I just shut the <laughs> up and you make you make your whole case? <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and I don't mind the interruptions because it's, okay. it's definitely important that we're on the same page. Otherwise, I'll be five points in and we'll be on a different page. Right. And yeah. We'll be disagreeing. So, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Okay. So, okay, let, cool. so let, maybe we should kind of go back. So where where did – where did we leave off at? Where are we, we at left we got off into at – well, actually, I really wanted to just talk about Euthyphro. But now right. we're talking <clears throat> about numbers, which, by the way, that's a tough one, man. Yeah, I told you earlier uh, – the, the listener might not know this, but Eric and I were – kind of bull for a while before the conversation he's a really cool guy i really enjoy talking to him like we were talking just about like how we're we're both kind of philosophy nerds and that's a topic i don't feel real comfortable with man i don't like talking about numbers because what are numbers is probably one of the hardest questions in philosophy and i'm sure you can respect that so i feel like this might not be the best way to go but if you want to just have like an open forum organically going with the momentum of the conversation let's do it brother i'm down yeah and, and so the reason i was getting there the, or rather the reason we left off there was because i was saying basically going back to the youth is god is where you reach the bedrock of the reason for which morality exists and to ask okay well why does god do these things well the answer to the youth would be that god is the good he is synonymous with the good it, it's his nature that that grounds the good and to ask well why is that good is akin to asking well why does the new york skyline look like the new york skyline You've reached the point to where you, you can't go any further than that. And if God being the best explanation for morality, because I would argue that without God, there can be no objective morality, then that's where you've reached the, well, the New York skyline is a standard for judging this contest. Hmm. Okay, laws of logic. The law of contradiction, the law of excluded middle, the law of principle of identity. I know you know that identity one because I heard you tearing in to David Smalley's <laughs> with that one. <laughs> with the <thesis laughs> of ship. Um. If you're saying that God and good or the nature of God and good mm -hmm. are synonymous, I feel like you and I both recognize as, as philosophy nerds that you're kind of having some identity problems here, right? If these two things are synonymous, then that would mean that I should be able to use them functionally. <laughs> and whenever I say, oh, that was good, that would be the same as, oh, that was God. That yeah. obviously so creates would... some major contradictory problems throughout not only the scriptures, but just our language itself. So it's a little confusing when you say that's his nature. Like, right. like so, it, 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 it makes way. me think like, where did he get his nature? Did he choose his nature? Because he's all powerful and he's all knowing. So... He must have given himself this nature. Well, no, the nature came from without. Well, oh, oh my God! Now we're right back to Euthyphro's dilemma: Is it from without God or is it God? Because if 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 it's beyond God, then we don't need God. We can do good without him. And you go, well, it's not necessarily good. It's the nature of good. Well, okay, we can get the nature of good yeah. without him. If it is God, then God is basically just the system of divine command theory, where you can just say anything's good. Punch an old lady's fine. Morality is just insignificant based yeah, on so his whims. 
let me let me jump back in. So it depends what the word of the meaning of the word is is. Are you going Bill Clinton on me? <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> okay, like, go. You're, there's so, a setup. Um, I ruined it. So there there's different kinds of uh, there's different kinds of of definitions to the word is. Uh, you have an is if so. If I said um, Eric is human, that's not an is of identity. That would be an is of predication uh, because Eric is human is not synonymous with saying humanity is Eric. But if I said Eric is Kendall's husband, then you could say that is synonymous with uh, – Eric is synonymous with Kendall's husband because that's an is of identity or an is of predication. Well, when we like say that, that God that's is cool. the good, we're referring to him as – his nature as the standard of good. So when I say that uh, it's synonymous, I'm talking about the nature of God being synonymous with the standard of goodness, the reason for which goodness exists in the first place. Hmm. So it wasn't an is of identity because I see what I see where the confusion was there is and uh, perhaps an is of predication or saying that this is the stand, God's nature is the standard and you, you can't go just like the number two rather being even is a number that is divisible by two or means something that is divisible by two. I really like this. This is new to me. It's fresh. I'm I'm excited. You're pushing my cogdis right now, and I love that feeling. Okay, pushing your what? My, my like my cognitive dissonance. You know, <laughs> like it's like it's like an S and M thing. Like where you know you're you're like submissive or you're dominant. <laughs> like you're like you're you're forcing somebody to feel things they don't. That's basically the whole theme of the show is is pushing people's cognitive dissonance. Say that one more time. Yeah. So um, go, going back to the identity thing, it wasn't an is of identity. It was um saying that God's nature, or rather not identity the way that you're thinking of, uh, synonymous with the word good, like, oh, that was good, and saying that was God. It's more of an is of that good is that which conforms to the nature and character of God, because that is what grounds uh, objective morality in the first place. So um, if I said, going back to the illustration I used, if I said Eric is human, it's not an is of identity as if I'm seven billion people, because if you switch it around, it wouldn't work to say humanity is Eric. But if I said Eric is Kendall's husband, then that is an is of identity because Eric Hernandez is Kendall's uh, husband, and you can use those interchangeably to refer to me. So that's why when you were talking earlier about numbers, where I was kind of wondering where you were getting at, uh, when I meant reflection of reality, I meant like that which corresponds with reality. So regardless of what we name something, um, whether we call red, red, or we call red, you know, whatever other language, or even said three or thrice, we're referring to something in reality regardless of the reference that the referent word that we use to refer to that thing. So the name that we use to refer to something may be contingent, like Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay. Mm -hmm. It's irrelevant to that the fact that we're actually referring to the same thing. So that same thing doesn't change, but the word that we use to reference it may change. God's nature is what grounds the goodness. It is a standard of good. It is a reason for which there's morality. Oh my That's God. That's where you're you Christian it full now. circle, that brother. Yeah, we, we were we were joking around about that dogma debate thing with thesis is ship. You're still talking about identity. You're doing it again. You're okay. you're on the same point, right? Am, am I following you? Uh, well, as far as God's nature, so the standard of goodness is God's nature. That would be the identity thing. But the whole problem with identity is that it is based on what we call it. No, that, no, no, that, no, that no. it I, exists call beyond it what you want. the identity that we give it. Say that again. The ship exists beyond. The identity with which we give it. Okay, just for the sake of listener, present thesis is ship for everybody, just in case they don't know it. Yeah, and and I we might be using this uh, differently. I'm not I'm not sure okay. how you, the way you're using it, but okay. thesis ship is is to refer to not just identity, but identity through change, whether or not something remains the same thing through change, um, which is not what we're talking about. But whoa, the, the... no, 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 you yeah, I think you missed it entirely, Eric, and and, and I mean no offense by that. But no, it's like one if, of us if I'm it, saying okay, if one of us, fair enough. OK, now somebody's making a false dichotomy anyway. But OK, <laughs> so it was never Theseus's ship. Mother <laughs> like, hold on, let me say that over. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. that way. No, 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 no. I don't mind the cursing. I'm just like, what? what? Yeah, I'm in it. I'm, I'm engaged, man. I'm, I'm, I'm actually passionate. No, um, I, I, I mean that, that like, like if we're having a couple beers and we're goofing off, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. But no, it was never Theseus's ship, Eric. It was <laughs> it's just what, what we called it. And then well, after I, you replace the boards, okay, I'm I'm getting ahead. Please, I interrupted you. Uh -huh. Explain thesis is ship for anybody that doesn't know, <laughs> and I will not okay, so, I will not say anything, and I won't call you a mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so thesis ship is an illustration that's used to refer to identity through change, and uh, you feel free afterwards to jump in and, and let me know if you you got something different. So the the problem was if we took the ship of Theseus. And we started to replace, let's say, just one plank, one board on the ship. Is it still the same ship? 
And let's say we replace two. Let's say we replace all the sails. And let's say we replace every single piece of the ship. Is it still the same ship? And that is the problem of identity through change. Do physical objects or aggregates retain identity through change? That was Theseus' ship. That was that is how the, the ship of Theseus analogy or illustration is used to convey whether or not something remains the same through change. Right, right. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. But was it his ship? At the, at the end of it, Eric Hernandez, apologist, theologian, soon to be author. Hey, what's, what's the name of that book you're working on? That's going to um, piss God. every atheist listener off. <laughs> it's both the I, subtitle. I why I'm not an atheist, the subtitle is an analysis of the logically inconsistent, philosophically incoherent, rationally unjustified, self-defeating, atheistic worldview. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it? Jesus. Well, hold on. Let me process that. <laughs> you triggered me. <laughs> My hair turned purple. Was it or was it not Theseus's ship after all the boards, all the nails, everything's been replaced, it's been repainted. You might even write a different name on the side of it. Whatever. You might call it the love boat. Is it Theseus's ship in the end, Eric Hernandez? So I would say no. And and the from what I understand the, the way the illustration is used, it's not necessarily used to refer to is it still his ship, but rather is it still the same ship? regardless of who owns it. Empirically. So it, You're making an empirical claim, whether it is physically the same, right? Sure, yeah. And even ontologically. Is it ontologically the same ship? How and could, I use could, that when talking about... How could anything be ontologically the same ship? In, in other ontology words... Ontology wouldn't so, even apply to Well, here's why. Here, here's, where, here's why. So when I argue... Uh, when I argue in, in a chapter of my book is on the soul, and one of the things I argue against atheism is that, uh, one, I would argue that the soul exists and that you can't account for the soul on atheism, and the soul is also what accounts for consciousness, rationality, the free will, rationality, things of that nature. Now, one of my arguments for the soul Allegedly. is that – Sure. Yeah. Fair oh. enough. So one of my arguments for the soul is that you are either a physical – a purely physical object or what's called an aggregate. An aggregate is a collection of parts held together in a certain structure, or you are a, a soul, an immaterial substance. Now, one of the ways we can find out which one we are is ask the question, do we retain identity through change? So rather than the ship analogy, I use the analogy of a car, and I say, you know, kind of same concept. Take a car, replace the wheels. Is it the same car? Replace this, replace that. After a while, let's say you replace every part on the car. Is it the same car? But before you answer that question, what if we took the old parts and put that together? Now you have two cars. Which of these two cars <laughs> is the original car? Whichever well, one you think it is. It doesn't matter because that's what identity is. It's false. Like, we don't exist in reality, Eric. We're just experiencing Whoa. consciousness. We don't exist in reality? Not in the same way as Theseus's ship does with identity. Right. Well, we are just well, uh, experiencing the world. There is no self. And who's saying this? I'm saying it, brother. Oh, you, yourself. Gotcha. And there's no self. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Myself is saying it. <laughs> yeah. Huh. The, the illusion that makes up me. <laughs> We work so off you, illusions all the time. But the, the same idea. Well, and that who's whenever, having the illusion, though? No, no, no. Whenever I talk it's, about that red apple, that apple is not red. Red well, is a conceptual is way to interpret reality. Our self is a conceptual way to interpret my own independent agency. Uh, whenever self, we talk right, about God, own, that is a yourself. conceptual way for you to interpret the objectivity of morality, whether or not it's good to drink battery acid or orange juice in the morning. There's an objective truth to that, and it's moral as long as I might do it to another human being. Morality so, is based on human flourishing. So if I pour oh, acid on. down your throat or orange juice, I'm doing something immoral because I am taking away your personal autonomy, your consent. Okay, so there's a lot you said there. You said there's no self. There's no such thing as like. <laughs> I got a little in weeds. No, it's okay. It's all right. All right. Maybe, maybe because of the weed, but no, it's okay. So there's, <laughs> there's, <laughs> and I'm playing with you, of course. I, I, I feel know, I when I play with you, well. I feel comfortable enough. It's good. Like, I called you a motherfucker earlier. I feel bad about that. So you <laughs> can true. make you can make any slams you want. I'm not going to push back. <laughs> okay, so. You said there's no self, there's no such thing as identity, and morality is based on human flourishing. Uh, wait, so wait, let's, wait, let's... wait, wait, wait. We're getting away from the theme of whether God is good or good is God. I'm not saying let's not do this. Let's do it. I would say, yeah, so so God is good because everything he does is going to come from his nature, and his nature is the very thing that grounds goodness itself. You're saying the nature of God is good. It's it's what grounds morality. Right. Because it needs and to I'm be – saying morality... this is semantics, my, my friend. Like this is – because I can then keep going from where did this nature come from? Did God yes. give himself this nature or is the nature beyond God? It's the same question. 
We're still in Euthyphro dilemma. Instead of no. interpreting morality, now we're interpreting nature of morality. And, no, and, it, and you can respond just... and go, well, the nature of morality actually is uh, and, and add a third word. Once again, these are all just forms of identity. We're right back to Theseus' ship, man. I, I still don't know why he used Theseus' ship to talk about that. But the, the when I – so uh, if you're saying what is the nature of morality, then you're asking a, a, an epistemological question about what is morality. But we're not talking epistemology. We're talking about the reason for which morality exists. And if it's grounding God's nature, nope. now you can disagree with that nope. bedrock nope. statement, nope. but you can't say it's going in a circle. Nope. I'm not asking about the reason that morality exists. That's that what would I'm be about. the that's ontological saying, nature of morality. That's not that's not what Euthyphro's dilemma is about, and that's not my question to you. No, we we can no, have that if you want to have that conversation. I'm I'm totally down with it. I can tell you that I'm I'm gonna get pretty <laughs> agnostic, you know, in the same way Matt Dillahunty got with you. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Like, and and, that, and like what... I'm I'm totally okay with admitting that, but that's not really the question from Plato. Right. And so I so the answer I gave like a few seconds ago was my answer, and then when you started going to the other stuff. And we might be talking fast each other. I understood you to now going into uh, what is morality, which is an epistemological question. So the argument on morality revolves around God being the reason for which morality exists. And the Euthyphro dilemma does say, okay, well, wait, a question of why Why is it that God is good? Is it because um, it's something that's beyond him? Or is it that whatever God does is good? And I would say, well, if God is the standard of good, then whatever he does will be good, given that his nature is what grounds the goodness in the first place. That would be my answer to Euthyphro. Hold on. Say it one more time. That God's nature is the grounding for which goodness exists. It's a standard of goodness. His and nature. hence, anything he does that comes from, that's obviously going to be coming from his nature is going to be good. Okay. At the risk of redundancy, is he appealing to a nature beyond him? No. So then, therefore, his nature is something he chooses? Well, I, his nature is something—no. Why would you— did, What's the did, relevance did of that he question? Give why him, would you think to ask this? In other words, it's an incoherent question to me. That I don't, I don't, how, I don't how think How can you is. choose a nature? Did he choose his nature? Or his no. was his nature given <clears throat> to him? No, no, nothing Nothing chooses its nature because if it exists, it already has a nature. So you can't choose a nature if you exist. By definition, you're going to have a nature. And if you how have a nature, did, you can't choose. How did he acquire nature. this nature? Well, so so those now, kind of questions, I would ontology. say. ontology. This is ontology. Right. Yes, absolutely. And I would say that he is a max, the greatest conceivable being, a maximum great being. And he is that necessarily. It's like, I mean, so how did you get that's your not name? an argument? That's that's some no, it's not. That's some not, 500 saying, year old we're, we're Ansel bullshit, a, dude. And no, no, no offense I, to you. I, I'm just I, saying, I, like, you, you can't just make some kind of circular logic where we're like, well, he is what he is because that is who he is. Like, what? That didn't explain well, it. So here's here's what I'm getting at that, that one of us here are missing is that when you reach a bedrock, <laughs> it's not as if you can keep going down. So it's kind of a similar problem, and I don't mean to bring up another topic, but the principle of what I'm saying is – so whenever I, I talk about atheists and I say, well, God is the first mover or he is the first cause, you say, okay, wait, well, what caused God? And I say, okay, let me try this again because I don't think if, – if you're arguing further, then you're not understanding the concept. <laughs> you're like, you I could, said you could, first. First yeah, means right. first. I'm with you. So you could disagree with the concept, but that doesn't necessarily mean that my answer is circular if, they're, if I'm saying here's the bedrock. And to ask me further questions about it, I'm just going to have to basically – to okay. find the same thing in different ways. Okay, fair enough. So if enough. if God is no, you know, if God is the standard of goodness, then it, it would become redundant, like we're saying, to kind of ask, okay, well, well, what is that, or what does that mean? Once I've defined it as, well, He is the reason for which goodness exists. Well, then it's like I really can't go any further than that. Just like why is New York skyline look like New York skyline? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me let me pull back. That was totally rational and reasonable. It seems like what you're saying, and correct me if I'm if I'm making a wrong uh, an inference here, okay? It seems like what you're saying is the same way that I would need to believe that a first mover is first is the same way that I would need to believe that the nature of God is goodness. And yeah, for fair. me to interpret these two concepts, make them synonymous, make them analogous to one another, I need some kind of equal sign. Like if we're making a formula... For God, which I, I understand, you know, he's beyond our understanding. But the best we can do, we have to make this equals that to understand it, right? Sure. And on one side of that equal sign is something we can get. And on the other side of that equal sign is something that we have a hard time understanding. So for <laughs> me to understand how these two things can fit together and how I can come to some kind of common ground with you, which is essentially what I want, really want to do. I want to find common ground and then both of us litmus test each other and see whether we got an asset or a base get down to brass tacks and admit hey 
I'm ready to change my mind. So, yeah, uh, or we say, well, we we disagree on this, and then that's where I would say you'd have to push back. Then okay, well then yeah. why does why yeah. does morality exist in the first place? Which is ultimately the argument on on morality and God, and that's where I would go to saying, okay, well, why does morality exist? What do you, what do you got? Here's what I got. What best explains this? And then that would also be a, then that would also go to what you're saying. Okay, well, who's going to change our mind, or do we agree or disagree? Because you know, vice versa. Absolutely, God's nature exists. And that defines who God is morally. That's a faith-based concept. Would, could could um, we agree to that? Um, I'm getting what you're getting now. Those weird vibes. I see what you're saying here. <laughs> uh, is God say say that one more time? The fact that God's nature is good is faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Well, uh, without faith getting into the is the evidence so- of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. This this is a faith based claim. Is that fair? Um. Well, if by faith you mean trust on reasons, because that's how I define faith. And if we, if God is a maximally great being, that that is a concept of God. The concept of God is the maximally greatest conceivable being that could possibly exist. Then he would be by de- by definition good. So in other words, we're taking something and saying, okay, what would this be like? What would a maximally great being be like? And part of that is being good. And if he is good, he's good necessarily by his very nature. This seems contradictory to me right from the start. Are you saying that I don't need faith to believe in God? I would ask what you mean by faith. But if by faith you mean trust, I would say you need no, trust. No, I don't mean. I don't mean the colloquial sense of faith. I have faith that the chair I'm sitting in is going to hold my butt up. But that's because I I have some knowledge of chairs and gravity and the yes. weight of my butt. That's not the same as religious faith. This is a, a conflation uh, of terms. Where you I, I were going with the nature there. of God, I finally relaxed. Like my, I, I'll tell you honestly, just physically, man, my shoulders kind of just went back. I'm <laughs> with you, dude. Like, okay, you believe it based on faith, and and that's okay. Like, I no. understand that. Well, well, hold on. I, so I disagree with your constant or notion of the word faith when it comes to the way a Christian would use it. I, I, I that's not the that's not the definition of faith, and I'd rather not get into a semantical debate on what the word faith means. But I would Fair say. Enough. The way, I, the way I just presented God is I'm saying, okay, look, if we're taking – what would a maximum great being be like? And then we list it out and say, okay, does this kind of being exist? And if it does, or rather setting that aside, if morality exists, then this, then this God would have to exist. Call him what you want. This entity, this greatest maximally conceivable being would have to exist if morality exists because his very nature would be the thing that grounds morality in the first place. Hold on. So that would be an argument for God's existence. It would be a reason. For which I believe this is this is old school greatest good stuff, man. We we got rid of this thousands of years ago. What are you got doing? Like, come on! If if there's good, there must be a greatest good. Is that what this is? No, 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 uh, no. Okay, maybe I misunderstood. So so I could give you reasons. A maximally great being. Yeah, and so you're slipping in maximally so that you don't have to deal with the laws of logic. How so? But you're saying wait, wait. the greatest being that could exist. Why would you because say that? Well, because the laws of logic cause problems for you. I mean, you know, it's that, it's that old thing. The, the same <laughs> thing you were, you were raising your hand to in Sunday school, that question never went away, no matter what your Sunday school teacher might have said. You know, whenever you say, well, they didn't even give can, me an answer. can God create a rock so heavy he can't lift it? That's why you throw that maximally thing in there, because you're like, no. there are things that so, exist beyond God. And that's the essence of the Euthyphro dilemma, is if there's no. something that exists beyond God, whether it be logically <clears throat> or morally, then why no. do we need God? No, so I, I think... I, and I don't mean this respectfully, but I think you have a misconception about of the argument or the concept of God itself. So, there, so even like your very question, could God create a rock so he can't lift? Well, that's just a contradiction. And I remember hearing like Blake Junta, you know, y'all talked about this too, and he gave a great response. The concept of God, God's uh, uh, omnipotence, is you know doing uh, actualizing anything that's logically possible. So that's not even a logically possible uh, thing that can be done. So the laws of logic work in my favor because that's just a logical contradiction. So if you're asking if God could perform logical contradictions, then I'd say you'd be the one that's having the problems with, with the laws of logic. What? You're, you're saying God cannot make a logical contradiction, right? Right, yeah, because right. that's not even a thing that, that can be done. Like what Blake said, can God do oogla, boogla, oogla? Well, that, that isn't, that's not even a coherent thing to be done. Then God is not truly omnipotent. He's maximally omnipotent. So you think omnipotence means you can do the logically impossible? All powerful. That is what the term means, all powerful. What? Okay, so all powerful in regards to what? So therefore, I mean, God could be not only God, but he could violate the laws of identity. Like no, we're referencing the thesis of ship. He could be truly God. Being, he could be the Father. He could be the Son. He could also be the Holy Spirit. He could be all three in one. 
that violates no. the laws of identity because he is omniscient <laughs> and he is omnipresent. And guess what? He knows what each of those three people are thinking, and they're all omniscient. So no, so the, the, the and they're all good. The By the way, back to Euthyphro, they're all good. He's omnibenevolent. These are so logical would... contradictions that you aspire to, but then you also say, well, he's maximally great, so he doesn't violate the laws of logic. But the very concept so, of God itself violates these things. So it sounds like what you're saying is, because I still think you have a, a misunderstanding of the, the theological concept of, of omniscience, uh, omnipotence, and things like that. So are you, are you implying that omnipotence necessarily entails the ability to do the logically impossible? I'm saying a priori, by definition, a bachelor is a bachelor because he's not married and he is not married because he's a bachelor in the same way if you are omnipotent you are all-powerful despite anything you are taking a status above that which is possible by definition because no, it is impossible no, to be all-powerful that's that's not what it means to be omnipotent that it doesn't exactly mean to do the things it, that are... that is what it is historically meant throughout all of philosophy it hasn't Who changed that? until these new apologetics come along the same way you guys criticize new atheists like oh well, you don't have to take the burden of proof i'm criticizing you guys man it's like it's like you're coming out like an army out of uh, biola and, and baylor and all these different places bob jones you know and, and you guys are coming out with these new ways of changing definitions and i'm telling you all powerful always meant all powerful powerful and now you're saying well it's not really all powerful so now it seems like we're, we're just it, it and i'm bitter mean, about it eric it's... and just so you know you're tapping into something that kind of pisses me off i'm not mad at you i'm bitter about the movement in the same <laughs> way like if we were arguing yeah. politics and i'm like you darn conservatives are you crazy liberals and, you know like it's not really like i'm saying you it's just like the thing irritates me at my core. Mm -hmm. What we're basically arguing is is a bit of a semantic thing because okay, it we're is. saying it is. could it be possible that when we we once thought this is what omnipotence meant, and perhaps we figured, oh no, that's not what it means, or could it be possible we should just pick a different word? I would say pick pick whatever you'd like. If God being all powerful again, it, that's where the semantic thing comes in. Call it, I, I would argue that we just come to learn things. I mean that that's how science, investigation, anything works. When you have a notion of something and you do further study, you think, ah, okay, I was mistaken before. Let's refine this. So whatever, however you'd like to view it, if God is all-powerful or omnipotent, and if by omnipotence we mean to do everything that's logically possible, then there's no contradiction. If you want to change the word from omnipotence to something else, I'd say, okay, fine, but here's the notion we're working with. If he's all-powerful, he's responsible for evil. No. This is a different topic. Is it possible... Eric Hernandez, to have you back on. I want to talk about the problem of evil. He's responsible for <laughs> hell. He's responsible for every rape victim. He's responsible for every murder. Is it okay to have you back on when we talk about that topic? Yeah, it'd be fun. And and I, I could just tell you the answer right now. No, because I'm not a Calvinist. <laughs> hey, you know what might be fun? I've got a couple Calvinist friends. What if I get you and a Calvinist together and you guys argue and then the atheist asks you both some questions? That might be fun, too. Might yeah, be, sure. might be a little that, that, weird. That, that sounds fun. Then, then you're, getting, you're getting hit from all angles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, one thing that people might not know about Eric Hernandez is this guy, this crazy, I'm going to say it again, but with no disrespect, this crazy mother <laughs> was a heavy metal band member. Uh, so I'm going to close you out with a uh, song from At Calvary. That was the name of your band? Yes, sir. That's so cool. And it's going to blow all these crazy satanic atheist people's <laughs> minds when they hear you like, oh, do, 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 do. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> They're about to get their mind blown. Uh, but anyway, before I close you out, uh, can you tell people how they can learn more about you, how they can learn more about your ministry, please? Yeah, uh, you can. Uh, uh, YouTube is and Facebook is where I probably keep stuff up to date the most. Uh, we have a website um, that I that I try to keep up to date, um, erichernandezministries.com. Go on YouTube. You can just type in that right there, Eric Hernandez Ministries or Eric Hernandez Debate. You can see debates I've done with, uh, with you know, like you mentioned, David Smalley, Matt Dillahanty. Even a, a Christian apologist, and I would say friend, uh, Saiten Brinkate on apologetic methodology. Ah, um, Brinkate. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, even some other stuff on things like divine simplicity and Molinism. So, yeah, either Facebook, uh, YouTube. I have a Twitter. It's EHM underscore apologetic. Between now and then, remember that you have the right to reason. Well, I don't know why I came here tonight. I got the feeling that something right. 
He has spoken and debated on a public level at university and college campuses where he admittedly and... <laughs> where he adamantly... <laughs> stop laughing. Stop laughing. All right. Here I am stuck in the middle with you. Start getting out of... Catch oh, there these. it is. Reverb out of I think I found it. Is that you? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a lot of reverb nation. Like, you were a punk rock fan? Like, atheism is awesome. Like, no, that's not me. Today we're talking to Eric Hernandez. He thinks atheism is awesome. Eric, what do you have to say? You're like, what? No, stop. Whatever. Um, but like, I, I kind of feel like, where was I going with that? What the? Hell? Did I have a theme? Help me out. Edit. Yeah. You were you're going to this uh, this your ship, and you were asking, "Is it still his ship?" Yeah, but why did I start talking about the color of my hair? <laughs> ehm underscore, uh, you know, I don't even remember. Ehm underscore apologetics or apologists, I can't remember. Hold on, Try hold one on, of those. Let me look it up real quick. Let's see. Let me pull up mine too. underscore apologetics. You'll find it faster than I will. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, some nice things about doing these not live yeah oh I, I i hate the live stuff dude i hate it because it, okay, it's ehm like underscore real. apologetics okay i'm sorry i was talking over you go ahead oh no uh... awesome no. anything else you, uh, you were wanting to put out there uh no yeah that's pretty much it all right as as you were saying all of that and i'll work in that ehm thing i'll i'll fade in your music at wherever it gets really cool you know like da -da 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 -da. Doo -doo 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 -doo. you know I'll, I'll just i'll raise the volume at the appropriate time and uh, i guess we're good man i feel good awesome. about that i i i know like doing this edited stuff makes it seem cheap and fake but at the yeah, at like the end it. of the day it's 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 getting i think an, a more honest <laughs> representation of what the person intends no, yeah, it's a good so, place. It, it'd kind of be like, you know, if, if I'm going to do a photo shoot, you're not going to, you know, take my picture as yeah. soon as I wake up. Yeah. You know, you're going to let me get dressed and, you exactly. know, put on some, you know. Yeah, some guy was saying something to me the other day. He's like, man, these these uh, podcast guys like Joe Rogan, are, they're so good on their feet. And I'm like, what? That's all fake. <laughs> oh, that's a very cynical view. I'm like, it's not cynical. Like, is it fake when you watch an NFL guy? score a touchdown no he worked for it he practiced over right. and over and over and over like, yeah. no, it, it, it's fake but it's not like it's not mm -hmm. fake like they're lying to you but there, there has to be a certain amount of deception to market anything i don't know maybe that is cynical. <laughs> that sounded pretty cynical at the end but you know what i mean you know what i mean i'm not crazy yeah i get, yeah, I get your heart I like when it. sam harris and peterson argue i i really feel like they and they don't intend to win they intend to uh create arguments that not only will help them financially but will also and, and this is the honest part this is the good this is the good part you only get a little mm. bit of good <laughs> and you, you gotta grab it and they hope that the people on the fence change their mind toward that way of thinking and i i feel like that's what you and i do you're not trying Absolutely. to convince robert stanley i'm not trying to convince mm. eric hernandez but we're both ideally that. but yeah yeah, I mean that would be cool, right? But yeah, you, know, you would like me to go to heaven with you, I'm sure. But that's that's not what you're what you're doing it for. I uh, 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 functionally, you're you're hoping that those people on the fence, are, they're either going to lean left or right, uh, right. politically. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, but you know, atheist, Christian, whatever. <laughs> um, and that's what we're working for. And I, I think we have a lot in common there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, the, I mean, you, you, that's pretty much exactly how I articulate it. And even when I talk to a Christian and I teach this stuff, I'm like, look, chances are you're not going to change the guy you're talking to, but there's other people listening. You know, because right. some people are like, oh, what are you, what are you debating right. for? What are you talking with these guys for? They're never going to change their mind. First of all, I'm like, well, screw you, dude. Like, first of all, I, I genuinely care about these people. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I, I genuinely the care about these people. from it, atheists. They're like, they weren't reasoned into Christianity. You can't reason them out. And I'm like, dude, shut up. Like, you, you have such a low opinion of humanity. Just to say that alone, That's a good whether way they're a Christian it. or an atheist, liberal, conservative, Muslim, Jew, I don't care. Like, come on, give them a chance. That's a great way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, that's. I like. I like how you said a low view of humanity and not Christians, because you're you're right. exactly you have it's, a low view. Yeah. Again, my Calvinist brethren might disagree with me, but yeah, no, exactly. I mean, like, why not? You know, root for you know, uh, 